What's up guys, my name is Matt, I'm a geology major, and this is my video on deformation matrices. So a deformation matrix is really just a way of representing strain. So to understand deformation matrices, we first have to understand strain. All strain is, is the resulting deformation from any given force or stress on a rock. And here is an example of lots and lots of strain in a very, very high metamorphic zone. Now, the classic example of this starts with the unit circle, which is represented by the surrounding unit square, which henceforth is represented by two vectors that border each side of the unit square. So when you put this system under strain, each of our vectors undergoes a transformation. The matrix that we multiply each vector by to cause it to undergo this transformation is the deformation matrix or deformation, deformation gradient tensor, if you like a bunch of words. And for this particular example, here that is. Okay, so let's take a look at that in a little bit of depth. Right here is our equation that we're using and here's the deformation matrix, here is the original vector, and here is the final vector which has undergone strain. All we really do is take this, multiply it by that, and then add this times this for the first row, and then so on and so forth for the second row, and it's the exact same thing for the second vector. So we can use the deformation matrix to get a bunch of other really cool stuff like rotation, dilation, and the strain ratio, but for the purpose of this video we're only going to focus on using the deformation matrix as a quantifiable measure of strain itself. This means that we have to go in the opposite direction, since anything we see in the field observing strain will already have undergone that strain. It's actually not that hard to do because these vectors right here simply just make up the deformation matrix, which easily allows us to convert back to our unit circle. In the field, things aren't always clean and pretty. We have to assume a certain amount of rotation with shear. Doing this allows us to have identical top values in our matrix and a zero for the bottom left position of our deformation matrix. In this application, we're allowed to do this because the original class position is incredibly hard to determine. And by class, I mean the small rocks inside a big rock, basically, that shows deformation. Also, this matrix is not perfect one to zero scale. So we can easily scale it by multiplying it by a constant. This means that, in theory, both a large and small matrix with identical shear will have the same deformation matrix. So obviously there's a lot of limitations with this method because whatever class you start with or whatever you use for a reference has to be kind of a perfect sphere. This is an example of a meta conglomerate right here made up of shale over here. And, well, in non scientific terms, shale is very flat. So, any measurements for vectors that you would get off of this meta conglomerate are not at all indicative of the overall strain that this rock has seen. One example of where this application of deformation matrices can be useful is with xenoliths. Xenoliths are where an igneous rock, basically just magma, picks up an external piece of rock. And while they're not always perfectly circular, if you get a large enough sample, it averages out. Um, if a xenolith undergoes metamorphism, since we can assume circularness with enough samples, then we can build an accurate deformation matrix that represents the overall strain in that formation. 